Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, September 12th, 2013. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Chris Loring of Notch Brewing shares some advice on brewing session beers, low-gravity brews with tasty character. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can find me on Twitter at at, uh, Basic Brewing, all one word. Also, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. Our show page on Facebook is at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. We're on Google Plus, too. And thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our uh, basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, you know what to do. Go to our website first. Click on our Amazon link. That will take you to Amazon. Then you can shop as you would, paying no more uh, as normal, but you'll be helping to support the show. And we greatly appreciate everybody who has done that. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site, too. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes and our Android app on Amazon.com. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory, and we're on the Stitcher app, and we're on Windows phone directory, too. Check out our brewer's logbook at basicbrewingshop.com. In the front is a blank calendar that you can use to track your fermentations and plan your brews, and there is room in the back to log the details of up to 50 batches of beer. If you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support. And thanks to everybody who has done so already. Protect your precious beer with one of our growler bags. Check those out at basicbrewingshop.com. I want to thank everybody who wrote in uh, following last week's episode featuring our friend Alan and his story of dealing with the dark side of alcohol. Uh, I was nervous about posting the interview, but the feedback that we received was very positive, and lots of it. Uh, Most of you who wrote in shared stories of your own or stories of relatives or friends who faced similar situations, and I really appreciate your thoughts, and I also appreciate the honesty that you guys showed. I've shared those letters with Steve and Alan, and I think Alan can look at those letters in the the future if he needs some, some positive reinforcement. So thank you so much for being so kind. Um, now, having said that, I'm going to, I'm going to hurry on to say that we are not going to become the nanny podcast, you know, wagging a finger of judgment at uh, all overindulgences. Uh, we are going to continue to celebrate our hobby and continue to learn about how to brew great beers, large and small. So don't worry about that. Now, having said that, I, I, I want to thank listener Dave, who uh, sent me the link to Lou Bryson's Session Beer Project blog. And I uh, contacted Lou and asked if he wanted to come on the show. He did want to come on the show, but he's got a new job, and he and he couldn't come on because of the conflict uh, with his employer. So, however, he did point me in the direction of uh, of Chris Loring, today's guest, uh, to talk about how to brew tasty, satisfying session beers that we can put in the mix of uh, what we brew. That'll happen in just a moment. But first, I want to pay an overdue visit to the mailbag to read a couple of letters. It's been a while since we've been there. Uh, We had a question way back, uh, several episodes back, asking about using homegrown hops in beers. And uh, Robert in Melbourne, Australia, wrote back with uh, what he does. Robert says, I just heard your podcast on the Sour Mash beer and heard the question about early addition of hops for bittering. Well, I've been doing it for my harvest ale I make for years. In the front yard, I built an arch over the driveway that's quite high, 12 and a half feet. And thanks for thanks for uh, for translating from metric there, uh, Robert. <laughs> uh, 12 and a half feet and been growing Cascade hops for almost eight years now. And in the last five, I've been brewing every late March an American-style ale with only using my fresh-picked hops throughout the 60-minute boil. The first time I tried this, I must admit, the bitterness was not where I had hoped it would be. I thought 75 grams would be more than plenty, but you live and learn. I now use 110 grams at 60, 80 at 30, 80 at 15, and 90 at flame out, and let it sit with the lid on for 20 minutes in an ice bath to chill a bit, uh, and then strain it into my fermenter. This takes a little time, as you will know how much hops it takes when they are freshly picked in a batch. 
uh, then chill and pitch. As far as flavor goes, I love it. Uh, to my taste buds, it's still bitter but softer, if that makes sense to you. I hope to hear more on this subject from the podcast from other listeners. So there you go. It takes it might take a couple of batches for you to dial in your uh, homegrown hops, but man, I bet that's a I bet that's a tasty one. Appreciate that, Robert. Uh, here's a note about something free and useful for you Android users out there. Uh, developer Adam Fisher writes, I just wanted to shoot you an FYI on a new release of my Brew Timer app for the Android. First of all, it's a free app, and I have no ad revenue from it. Uh, I wrote it because I needed it for my own brewing and thought of uh, and thought other people could use it. It's a labor of love for me. The app is basically a boil timer for brew day. I got so sick of using a kitchen timer because it kept breaking on me <laughs> and setting the right times, etc. when I had multiple additions was a pain. Adam says a future version will be able to import recipes from exported files or recipe files and the ability to also time mashes. Would love to hear feedback from any and all users at brewtimer at humanjoe.com. So Android users, go to the Google Play Store and search for Brew Timer, two words, published by Human Joe Labs, and send Adam a note to let him know what you think. And tell him, tell him we sent you. Uh, okay, there we go. Let's get into our chat with Chris Loring of Notch Brewing. Well, Chris Loring, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Notch Brewing, up there in Massachusetts. Tell tell us, give us some background on, on you and on your brewery. Well, I've been a professional brewer since 1993, so I've been at it for a while. I did take a couple of years off um, you know, after the uh, the mid-90s kind of doldrums, excuse me, mid-2000s doldrums in craft beer. Um, but uh started brewing... Um, at a small brew pub in Maine. Uh, there was the co-founder, head brewer, and eventually production manager of um, Tremont Brewery in Boston from 94 to about 2004. Uh, we sold the shipyard, a competitor, and then uh, that's when I got out of the business for a few years. And then uh, when I started Notch, it was um, really because of when I got back into the brewing industry, I wanted to bring something very different that was going on. And I always loved session beers. I, I apprenticed under two Brits. And so I, I've been, uh, you know, probably more than most kind of, um, aware of British beer, uh, session beer, um, from a very early age. And I, I always loved to drink session beer. It just wasn't readily available, but for me, it's what I really liked. I knew it was hard to brew. It could have complexity. Um, and I like to drink, I like to have four or five beers. I don't like to have one and go home. Um, so for me, when I got back into it, uh, session beer was the, the national calling because it wasn't being paid attention to. This is about 2000, 2008. I started to hash the plan for Notch. And um, you know, at that time, the direction clearly was going the other way in terms of ABV um, and more intense pl- flavor profiles. So I was told I was insane by most of my friends who you know knew what I was doing and by other brewers that I knew. But I really felt that we were going to swing back to some type, some type of um, equilibrium in terms of what was being offered. And it, it seems to be coming around at that point, at this point, that we see uh, nothing's absolute. I'm, I'm not against any kind of beer. I love all kinds of beer. I mean, last night I had um, with my wife after this neighborhood meeting we went to, you know, we had some pretty high ABV beer, beers. Um, you know, that was just a moment that I wanted a, a higher alcohol beer. I knew I was going to have one to be done. Um, but um, so when I got back back into it with Notch, it was you know just to have a session beer brand um, and just to offer the consumers something different that was currently being offered and something I really love to brew and I love the history of it and beyond British style beers, I've taken a couple trips to the Czech Republic and I I, I really had an epiphany there that um, you know session beer is just not British miles or British bitters. There's a whole range of session beers that we as U.S. brewers have just not paid attention to. Um, and so I really wanted to ex- start exploring those styles and, and get into it. And so it's been a lot of fun. So I've been at this now for three and a half years. Uh, first year was draft only. And then I introduced bottles about two and a half years ago. And I just introduced cans two weeks ago. So slow, steady growth this year. We've really seen um, uh, you know, much stronger growth. And this year was this this was to me the year of session beer for a number of reasons. But for, for me, this year really was the year I said, all right, this could be a real company that this isn't just some kind of you know, Don Quixote kind of like uh, effort to like uh, bring something to the consumers that they didn't want. 
<laughs> you're forcing these people to buy the stuff if, you know that's good for them <laughs> well yeah it's just there's always doubters right in anything you do there's going to be someone who chimes up and says that's never going to happen it's not going to work and there was a lot of that at the beginning but the more i think people became in tune with what i was trying to do i wasn't trying to create something out of nothing i was basically just bringing recipes and styles and culture to the united states that we haven't seen before haven't experienced before and people love stories. They love experiencing new things. Um, and so I think when they got the head around, well, session beer is just not this made up thing where we dumb down existing beers. These are actually beer styles we just haven't seen yet. Uh, that that kind of it kind of changed the conversation in a way that people really were more receptive to it. I also realized as a big consumer group like myself, who's in their 40s and been drinking craft beer for 20 years, who cannot wake up every morning with a hangover, mm. that they can't overindulge. They have to keep an even keel because work, life, family, all these things get in the way of our love of craft beer. Um, and I, I think session beer was just this way that people could identify, hey, I can have three beers on a Tuesday night and feel pretty good the next morning. You know, go for a five mile run and go to work and not be, uh, not be you know, affected by the beers I had the previous night. So for me, that was, that was part of it as well, that um, as much as I loved session beer as a young kid, kid, a you know, brewer in my 20s, as a brewer in my 40s, um, it, was, it was the functionality and benefit of session beer that I really loved. So just as, I mean, is there a is there a formal definition of what is a session beer or is that kind of a moving target nowadays? Well, you, you went right at it right away. This is good. Well, the session beer definition in the United States um, is, is pretty loose. I mean, we don't even have a beer culture um, that is older than 25 years. I mean, prohibition screwed a lot of things up in this country. So we've only been trying to get up, you know, off of our backs 25 years ago to, to reinstill beer culture in this country and, 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 you know, brew good beers and have good beers accepted. So session beers, we, we really don't have a definition. Um, we have cultural experiences around light beer that are lower than average um, ABV, but I wouldn't call it session beer because it kind of lacks flavor. Well, that kind of it does. Uh, the home of session beer in terms of the name comes from Britain or England. Um, they don't really have any definition other than what is a cultural standard by brewers. And that really sits in the uh, bitter, best bitter, ESB kind of um, stratification uh, of styles. And bitters typically are low fours and under. So there's no real hard line. There are a couple countries that do have very specific uh, alcohol guidelines in terms of um, what and what ABV has an associated name? The Czech Republic has a um, has a uh, designation of eight Plato to ten point five Plato as being uh, moderate or lower alcohol beer. I'm not going to pronounce the name for you because it, it's just it's you know Czech, Czech <laughs> the Czech language is pretty difficult, but it's basically tap beer is what they call it. Um, or Desika. Desika is basically ten ten Plato. That's what we order at the pub. Where Germany has a I believe it's called it, Schunk beer. And Schunk beer is basically the same designation in terms of Plato, and typically falls in around three to four percent ABV, and that will include Berliner Weiss. Uh, so there are countries that have style, um, excuse me, uh, alcohol definitions, um, but nothing related to session. But what I would say is, no country that de- defines their beer defines session beer above four point five percent. You won't find that. You know, in the United States, we've had this. Well, I can session anything. Well, that's yeah, I'm happy for you. That's that's quite an achievement. The reality is session beer is lower than what is standard. S- standard may be that moving target. In the United States, standard has been 5% ABV you know, since Prohibition. Now, that's risen with craft beer, and you could argue standard may be 5.5%, but the CDC, or Center for Disease Control in, in the United States, when they talk about a unit of alcohol, they're talking about a 5% ABV beer in a 12-ounce serving. Mm. And that's, that's, to me, standard. So to me, session beer is lower than 5%. I say 4.5% just to have some distance. And I jumped on the back of Lou Bryson, who has a session beer project, who was already running with that definition. So um, th- that's the one I went for. And I've seen session beers in Germany and Czech Republic, or not, not called session beers, but are in the high fours, actually low fours. And then um, you know, I've seen uh, bitters in, in England that are 4142. So you know, there's not this hard line of four, there's not this hard line of five. It's just lower than standard, I'm happy with. I, I, I used to split hairs about that, but I realized we weren't advancing the cause. Mm. Um, and. Yeah, as long as you understand that session beer means moderate to low alcohol, I think we're in the ballpark. Yeah, back when I was in college, uh, 
if a beer was more than 5% alcohol, it had to be labeled a malt liquor. Uh, and nowadays, uh, you know, my my session beer I consider to be uh, something like Avery IPA, which is 6.5% alcohol. <laughs> uh, you know, and it, it's just something you get used to over time. Um and that's not that's not a good or a bad thing, you know. Uh, but uh, because I I love big beers, I love big beers, and I cannot lie. Uh, <laughs> but uh, a friend of mine said that uh, you know he also likes peach pie, but he doesn't have one every day. Uh, so you know we I'm 48 now, and I you know I've been visiting my doctor lately, and he's worried about my blood sugar levels and such as that. So you know I need some variety in my in my um, in my beer diet. Yeah. That's what session beer is. It's an option. It's nothing. It's no more, no less. It's an option for when you need to have something a little bit lower in alcohol, but you still you don't want to sacrifice flavor. There's something there for you. It's all. And it's it's all I was ever trying to do is provide an option that if I walk into a bar, I can have three pints and drive home and not you know have blow a BAC above you know two point zero, whatever the, the amount would be. So, um, you know, the name session beer. I, th- I think the term session itself is the one that's been kind of a lightning rod. If there was another name except session, I'd use it. But that was the British used, and because we share a language, you know, insert joke here, um, I thought session was a pretty good way to do it. Um, if, and I've said this before quite, quite a few times, if all beers contain the ABV clearly marked at every point of purchase and every container, we don't need to use session because we would have the information required for us to make informed decisions. But that's not the case. Bars don't do it. Um, not everyone puts ABV on their, on their package. Um, the government restricts it in a lot of states, uh, and you know, up until '97 or so, we weren't even allowed as brewers to put it on the label. So there's that whole cultural thing again, post-prohibition laws that kind of prevented the communication of ABV to the consumer in a way that, that would lead to responsible behavior. But the government looked at it the opposite way that if we, we provided that information, people would take the path of least resistance to getting drunk. Mm. Now let's talk about uh, let's talk about strategies for brewing these things. Okay. Um, is it as simple as just cutting down the ingredients proportionally in a recipe and coming out? I mean, can I take you know my favorite IPA recipe and just use a calculator and divide the ingredients and and come up with a good session beer out of that? I mean, you could do it. I don't think you'd be happy with the results. I think you'd you'd have basically a dumbed down beer of whatever you had before. That's that's the challenge. Uh, I love the comment that session beer is, uh, you know, a watered down version of the existing beer. And my response to that is always, well, is IPA a, a watered down version of double IPA? No, they're different entities. They're different recipes. It's a different mindset. When you go after each one of those recipes, you're going after different. You're trying to, you have a goal that's different than uh, either like scaling up or scaling down. Um, so I attack session beer in a way that just doesn't simply cut the malt bill. Uh, and you know, hope for the best. So th- th- there's a lot more um, finesse involved in making a session beer uh, than just cutting that back. And, so, and I'm also asked the question: Is session beer harder to brew than other beers? And I would say it's the challenge. It's not harder to brew. The challenges are different because your goals are different, and the method to get to that goal um, may just the, the process or the ingredients may be different. So it's just it's just a different challenge. So what is the what is your number one strategy? I mean, if you're if you're designing a session beer, what's number one on your list? My number one strategy is a personal um, preference. I really dislike sweet beers. They just are not what I like to drink. Uh, maybe once in a while I'll sit down and have something fairly sweet, and I'll have six ounces of it and I'll be done. Um, my relationship with beer that again I like session beer, so I like things to be dry. I like them to be dry because I want to be invited back for another sip. And I don't want to be fatigued by my beer. If I start to be fatigued by my beer, I'm going to start drinking bourbon because I just it's just not what I want in the beer. Again, that's all personal. That doesn't mean that's right, wrong. But that's just so from a, a brewer's viewpoint with Nosh, the beers typically will be on the drier side. That doesn't mean they're not going to have a malt character. Or some people might look at my beers and say, "Yeah, that's sweet," because my my dry might be someone else's, you know, sweet. It's, it's just subjective. So. Um, I try to limit um, residual sugars in my beer by uh, my mash schedule and my mash temps. But, um, you know, if we dry these beers out too much, uh, there's going to be perception that they're thin. So that's really, that's really, that, that's one, you know, balance I always fight with is that my mash schedule and mash temps um, and what my um, grain bill is 
um, how does that resu result in um, a final um, residual sugar or dryness of the beer? So other things start to come into play that we build off of water treatment. You know, are we dealing with a, uh, a soft water source? And if we are, how do we want to treat that water to either accentuate uh, bitterness or, or dryness in the beer, possibly with calcium sulfate? Or how do we want to increase um, you know, palate fullness, possibly with um, chloride um, additions? So, you know, the water interplays with how that beer is going to finish in terms of uh, dry versus sweet. And then also yeast attenuation and yeast selection is critical. That, you know, some yeast will have a high degree of attenuation. And coupled with maybe with, dry, with a hard water um, and a certain um, uh, mash schedule and malt bill, you may have something very, very unpleasant that finishes really dry, really harsh, really bitter, and not... <laughs> Not, a, not, not uh, asking you to have another sip. You're gonna, you're gonna move on. Uh, and, and some yeast will have low attenuation and provide a lot of residual sugar that may be really um, appropriate in the style you're going for, but may not be appropriate in other styles. So you can see you start to build, and it's, I start from that that dry sweet um, equation all the time, and I start to build on all those variables or pay attention to all those variables that will start to impact that balance. And that, that's usually my starting point. And also stylistically, what am I, what, what am I, what's my goal? Am I doing a pills? Am I doing a, a, you know, a black lager? Am I doing some kind of low ABV IPA? I mean, what, what are we trying to get at? What's the goal? And then I'll start, you know, all those different variables. Um, and there's a couple other things, you know, as well. I mean, some of the more minor things, but I think those are some of the larger ones that will impact the overall, at least in my mind, the, the flavor balance that I'm looking for. So one would assume that, uh, if you if you want a low gravity beer with a fairly substantial mouthfeel, that uh, uh, crystal malts or specialty grains may enter into it. That would be your first assumption. Uh, <laughs> I I found that crystal malt is really the devil's malt for session beer. I think crystal malt in high proportions in session beer lend them to being a little bit fatiguing in terms of this crystal malt sweetness. Um, I love British bitters. But I think the reason why we see British bitters with a percentage of crystal malt at a, at a certain level is that a lot of these are being backed up with uh, water rich in calcium or, or hardness. And th those, again, that balancing act between um, the dryness of that, that uh, you know, finish versus what we have in the, in, the, in the malt bill. So I think crystal malt can work. But, again, you've got to start thinking about these other factors in terms of what your attenuation of yeast is going to be and what your, your water um, makeup is before you really figure out how much that crystal malt may, may play in there. Um, you know, I, I've, I've experimented a lot with a lot of different crystal malts or carob malts in general. Um, I've had varying degrees of success uh, based upon you know, which direction we went to. I find the British crystal, which I love um, in a lot of beers, I find for session beers is very, very difficult to use. One would assume that if you're, if you're having a beer with a fairly uh, lighter uh, balance a lighter flavor profile that in, more interesting base malts would also come into play that you could you could have more fun with them. Yeah, base malts are, are a big part, I think, of uh, having a successful session beer. And it, th this gets into the the, um, uh, the value equation people look look at session beer. How come session beer is not less expensive? And the reality is a lot of my cost of goods are more expensive than if I brewed a beer that was 2% more alcohol because I'm using more expensive ingredients. So that wipes out any cost savings you may have by having slightly more malt. And uh, some of my you know, base malts are uh, almost twice as much as if I just used a silo malt from say, you know, Canada, Pills malt or, you know, raw uh, pale malt or something like that. Uh, I use, um, I use faucet malt, uh, Golden Promise in some of my ale recipes and Golden Promise is just a wonderful malt. I really dig it. I like it a lot. Maris Otter, I know is really highly regarded. I, I, um, I don't have an aversion to it, but I don't, I don't love it. So uh, faucet malt, uh, Golden Promise, I love it. It's a really great malt to give a little bit of a uh, more character. Um, I think it provides a little bit of perceived sweetness. It definitely is a, um, you know, a malt character you can't uh, emulate with American malts. And um, I kind of like it. I like it more than Maris Otter. I know Maris Otter is really well regarded, and I think it's a really great malt. I just I, I found Golden Promise to be a, a better performer. Uh, for some of my uh, Czech beers, I make a lot of Czech lagers. I'll use Weirman quite a bit, um, either uh, Munich or Vienna, and I, I'll, 
oftentimes I'll use either either one as the base malt, like no pills malt at all. Um, I brew a Czech black lager in the wintertime. It's a 4% a 4% uh, lager. That is uh, all uh, – well, it's a combination of Vienna uh, and Munich as the base malt hmm. uh, environment. It's, you know, it's That's not cheap. That's pretty expensive. Uh, and then um, I do a, a Czech uh, – it's called Pullet Mavi, and Pullet Mavi is an is a amber, uh, amber Czech lager. And that has uh, all Vienna malts as well. So, you know, I could use pills, but – I kind of like the way those base malts set themselves up uh, for flavor. So yeah, I think the base malt is something to definitely take a look at. And from the homebrew level, I mean, it's, it's not a lot of money to, to step up to those malts. I mean, it's really you know, almost insignificant. Um, and then, uh, but yeah, I do play around with uh, especially malts as well, like you talked about. It's uh, I mean, we are in a, a world right now where the brewer it, it just has so many options in terms of the different malts that they can use. And not only barley, but in terms of rye and wheat. And um, you know, spell or any other kind of what we would call an adjunct, but any other kind of grain that you can put in, and that that's been really rewarding for me as well. Is that we have a local maltster here in um, in Massachusetts, Valley Malt, and so we've been able to work with them in terms of getting some specialty malts and specialty grains that otherwise wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have access to, and that's been a lot of fun to experiment with. Uh, yeah, and did I answer your question on the base malt? I'm gonna I'm going off on a tangent here, especially malts a little bit now. Yeah, I think uh, in fact I. I... You, you mentioned adjuncts. You've got a beer uh, named, uh, is it the Mule? The Mule, yeah. That has a lot of corn in it or has corn in it. And uh, I, I noticed that you had a blog post up on your website where you kind of uh, got on your soapbox <laughs> defending your choice of uh, corn. Did you get some flack uh, from craft beer lovers on that? Yeah, I didn't get flack, but I got uh, uh, confirmation that people have a um, – uh, odd viewpoint of how, how, how corn uh, manifests itself in beer and what the expectation is. But yeah, it was, it was definitely a soapbox kind of issue for me because I just don't understand how the Brewers Association can make a definition that says, you know, brewers cannot use corn and be called a craft brewer. And granted, they say it's 50% of your volume is, a, is, a, is adjunct to um, lighten flavor. But as brewers, we are um, celebrated for using every ingredient under the sun except corn and rice. You can't use that. That's bad. And I, I just find that's just short-sighted. That, that's a very 90s kind of construct. That's a very 90s kind of viewpoint, or even 80s viewpoint of what the difference is between craft beer and, and, and industrial lager. I think that just needs to go away. So I've been brewing with corn since the get-go. When, when I was in the brew pub in 93, this is an era where we were trying to teach people what craft beer was about. And this, is, this was a 20-year shift in mindset that we've gone through. And initially... Brew pubs had to offer this really light beer that they were serving because they didn't have a license to have Bud Miller Coors. They had to make their own light beer. And so I started started up brewing a lot of light lot, light ales that had corn flake. And so I got got a really good understanding of how corn has a – what that impact has on the beer. What I've come to realize is that corn in of itself isn't, isn't evil or it, it doesn't make beer bland. The recipes make, make the beer bland. Corn can actually add you know, a great deal of, um, of uh, character to the beer. So I wanted to do a light lager. That was 4.2%, which mimics the ABV of all industrial light lagers, but sure that you can have a beer with flavor and use corn. So I used an heirloom or heritage corn variety from Western Mass. We used that in the form of grits and had to do a cereal mash. And then I used, I used a couple of um, uh, U.S. what I call lager hops, but hops of you know lager heritage, uh, Crystal and Sterling, which I love, that um, have a little bit more uh, fruit and citrus and, and lemon in the aroma than a traditional lager hop. Uh, and that played off really well against the corn. Corn has this perceived sweetness up front, but it really dries the beer out in the finish. And I think that really sets itself up for that kind of delicate hop to come through. So I was really happy with the beer and people's reception was really strong. But I think it just shows that um, you can think outside the box in terms of what um, what malts or grains you can use to add add flavor. Um, yeah, I use a lot of, of specialty malts that people would only use in a, um, in a, in a you know oatmeal stout or something like that. But I've been able to translate some of that into lighter, lighter beers and, and have you know, similar results in terms of the perception of mouthfeel and whatnot. So, um, yeah, so there's, it, the more you experiment, the more iterations you go through, the more you find out that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of myths out there about certain ingredients being um, you know, only good for one thing, and the reality is that they may be good for multiple things. Yeah, I guess no... Well, there may be some evil ingredients out there, but it, uh, I tend to think that no no ingredient by itself is evil. It's uh, it's it's how you use it or how you potentially use it. Right. Uh, right. 
And it, it, it would seem to me that, that with a, lo- a lower gravity beer, uh, are there pitfalls? I mean, do you get do you start to get into uh, possibly pulling out some astringencies from the mash, or, or, or are there are there some rookie mistakes that uh, someone who's not used to working with a lower gravity beer can fall into? Yeah, I mean, pH control is a really important one. If you're a home brewer and doing a full uh, uh, an uh, all grain um, beer, um, you want to pay attention. If you don't have a pH meter, an easy way to do it is to pay attention to your last running's gravity. You know, typically, anything below ten eight or, or eight. Uh, excuse me, a uh, 10.8 or 2 plate up, you're going to start to see a real uh, rise in pH, and you're going to start bringing out a lot of tannins uh, in those last runnings into your uh, into your wort, and that's going to lead to astringency. So you really want to pay attention there. Um, a lot of um, a lot of brewers brewing any kinds of any type any type of beer will pay attention to that, and we often um, liquor down uh, to get a, a full kettle. So we'll stop runoff. Say we have a you know 100 barrel. Um, kettle and we're bringing over 90, um, 90 barrels of wort, but those last 10 barrels are going to be filled with high pH, uh, tannin rich wort. We're going to shut that down and liquor down, um, to get a hundred barrels, but we've basically set the recipe up so that we know that we're going to be liquoring down. So we have a higher gravity wort than we need liquor down, uh, obtain the, um, the target gravity that the pre-boil target gravity that we want and go from there. So, you know, little things like that you need to pay attention to. I mean, these beers are delicate. You know, they're not, it's not about intensity of flavor. It's about complexity of flavor. And so because they are delicate, uh, some of these faults um, that may not uh, be able to be uh, recognized in higher ABV beers will be recognized in, uh, in session beers. Yeah, just, to, just to clarify, when you say liquor down, you mean uh, just simply diluting with water in the, in the right. brewpot? Yeah. So it's better to rather than run that water through the grain that's in the in the mash tun. That's probably going to start pulling some tannins and, and astringencies right. off. Stop right. that. Uh, set up your recipe so that you collect higher gravity in the beginning and 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 dilute it in the kettle. That's right. it's it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a nice little nice little uh, tool to use. And again, if you don't have a pH meter, you can just I would check the gravity and the gravity typically. Um, you know, two Plato or, or uh, you know, 10, 10 08 is typically where you, you're starting to see a real spike. You're getting above 5.8 pH, which is really the the limit of what you want to be bringing into your brew kettle in terms of the pH of the, the last runnings. So, help us help us uh, design a recipe here. I mean, if if you've got someone who's the first time thinking about a session beer, they like hoppy IPAs. Um, you know, just just throw out a recipe on the fly there. What what, what would you start with on the on the homebrew <laughs> level? I mean, what is there a is there a kind of base recipe that you that you start off of? I think a really easy thing to do would be to take a look at maybe an IPA that you've brewed and start breaking down the components of the beer and say, all right, so we we have a say a six percent IPA and we want to make a four percent IPA. Um, so take a look at your base malt. And if your base malt is a you know generic two row, um, substitute that for a really good British two row, um, or uh, you know even a German two row, or you know maybe augment that with a little more, say Vienna or Munich, um, just to add you know a little bit of complexity to that malt bill. Um, if that malt bill is pretty straightforward, you may want to look at a little a couple little things just to add some perceived mouthfeel. Um, you might take a look at maybe oats or flaked barley or carapils or one of those that may, you know, add a little bit of mouthfeel. Take a look at your mash temperatures. If you, know, you bring an IPA of six to seven percent, you may be mashing in anywhere between 148 and 152 or somewhere, unless you're making a really sweet IPA. You know, you might want to you might want to adjust that, take it a couple degrees up, just so you get a little bit more residual sugar. Take a look at your yeast strain. If you're using, um, you know, Chico or you know one of the American yeast strains and having high degree of attenuation, you might want to think about changing that um, to a, a yeast with less attenuation. Maybe something like a, um, you know, British yeast um, that you know the attenuation level is not quite as uh, quite as high. And then for hops, um, it, stop, don't bitter, don't, no bittering hops. Just throw those aside. Do everything late kettle. Uh, whirlpool and dry hop, just back backload it because the you'll get utilization. You'll get plenty of utilization late in the kettle. You get plenty of utilization in the whirlpool or just when you're when you're knocking out. And um, you know, dry hop as you would normally. Um, you know, don't be afraid to dry hop at levels you would do for a higher alcohol uh, IPA. 
Um, if it's too much, so, you know, I, it's rare I hear a homebrewer say oh, no, that had too many dry hops in it. That was just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I have fun with it. You know, I have. I mean, if if you if you go overboard a little bit, you know, dry hop is probably not a bad place to do it. That's why I say get rid of the bittering hops because you don't need a lot of bittering charge. You're going to get you know a fair amount of utilization at the end of the at the end of the um, boil, and you don't need a lot of bitterness um, in a session beer uh, because you got to you're going to achieve that bitterness balance um to malt balance you know pretty quickly um then water treatment if you want to get into that you know calcium chloride if you want a little more perceived palate fullness or calcium sulfate if you want to dry the beer out a little bit so just look at all your components and just um you know take a look at substitutions um and modifications that will you know, try to offset that reduction in, in malt sugar um at the start of start of fermentation do you think it'd be, uh, I don't know how much experience you have with extracts and home brewing with extracts, but do you think it would, it could conceivably be, conceivably be easier to design an extract low gravity recipe? Yeah, it's, it's been a long time since I looked at what's available for extracts for home brewers. And so I'm not really sure what the availability is, but I, I, I if there is a higher um, quality extract that you can get your hands on for a base extract, I'd go for that and then start taking a little bit harder look, especially in malts. Again, not so much crystal malt, but other like rye, um, wheat, um, you know, flaked oats or flaked barley or maybe some carophils. Um, and then you can achieve color um, from darker crystals if you want. And then, you know, again, depending on what the recipe you're, you're trying to achieve or the recipe you're, you're going after, you know, that may, may dictate that. I mean, I, I don't want I don't want to say back away from from crystal malts altogether. Um, my churn my churn a pivo, which is a Czech black lager, I use a fair bit of what's called Cara Bohemian, which is basically a crystal malt. It just has a it has a fun name, um, but because that's a that's a it's a pretty rich beer in terms of um, you know the roastiness and a little bit higher uh, terminal gravity, and we want that to have some slight sweetness in that beer. You know that that's okay. It's just that that's that's what I'm going after. I guess I'm looking, you know, more pale lagers or something like that. You know, the crystal malts, you know, just be careful of them. Now, and, and looking at your beer list, and uh, the lowest one that I see here is this, uh, uh, the Taffel beer. Is that how you pronounce it? At 2.8% ABV? Yeah, so Taffel beer basically is a table beer. Um, you know, the Belgians originally would have table beer during dinner to introduce their children to, to, uh, to beer. And they were, so they're always very low alcohol. And 2.8 would actually be in the high end of a table beer. They're below three, but typically they're closer to closer to two. And uh, the fun story with this one is that uh, table beer was available in Belgian schools up until I think the 70s, <laughs> and uh, they were removed from schools, um, replaced with sugary sodas, and now some Belgians uh, uh, blame the table beer removing being removed from schools made their children fat. So there's actually a move now to get it back into schools, which I think is kind of funny. But I, that beer was brewed because I wanted something in the summertime that was really refreshing but flavorful and super dry. Um, and uh, I told a story. I kayak all the time in the summertime and you know, out in the ocean, and uh, it's no place to be drunk. You just you have to keep your wits about you. But I love to stop and have lunch and have a beer, and Toffel beer is what I wanted to have at those times because I could have a 22-ounce beer at 2.8%. Pretty good. Um, and uh, so that beer was uh, – was really about yeast selection, and that really shows how yeast selection. So if we move away from the pale ale category for a while and start looking at other other styles, you know, Belgian styles or um, you know, other styles where, where yeast selection becomes more important, um, yeah, that that was a uh, a Belgian yeast that provided a, a great deal of attenuation. So that beer was super dry to the point where people thought it was a sour beer because the tartness was so impressive. Um, it was a ten. Maybe 1036. I think it was eight Play Doh, the starting gravity, and um, uh, it just it had a great tartness to it. I, I, um, dry hop with sterling, and uh, used pretty expressive yeast. And the malt bill was was simple, but uh, base malt of um, of uh, a couple Belgian malts, one that people wouldn't think about using for a, a base malt, and it, it really you know expressed itself in just this wonderful way. Hmm. But uh, it was only I only did it for one summer. I didn't come back this summer. I'll, I'll do it again, but um, summer's such a great time to experiment with different different session beers. I want to keep you know rotating in different different summer beers. 
So talk a bit about, I mean, we have a lot of people, uh, I mean, it seems like everybody who's ever stood around a brew pot for any length of time wants to wants to go pro. Uh, and you talk about your business strategy, because your business model is kind of non-traditional. You don't, you don't have your own brewery, right? That's correct. So I still don't know what to call myself. I really don't like the term gypsy brewer. I don't know what it means. Um, so I just call myself an independent brewer. It, it may be because I've been at it for a while. Um, you know, I thought about this in a different way. You know, I, you know, I went to brewing school. I've you know, been a professional brewer, and I've been all through all those iterations. So I didn't come into this with this you know, desire, I need to have a brewery. I mean, I ran a brewery. It's a, it's a major pain in the ass. So I, I wasn't waking up in the morning saying, i really like to go do that again. Um, you know, will I again someday? Yeah, I'd like to have a, uh, I'd like, I'd like to have notch advanced so we can have a brewery. And have the volume where that that would that would be required. Um, I, that'd be a huge success for us. But you know, I realized from a business standpoint, um, using exist, existing capacity in local brewers would be would be uh, less risky. The startup capital was less, um, and my only desire was that I had control over every aspect of the operation and could be hands on in every aspect of the operation. So, I uh, start I, I started mostly Mercury Brewery. And uh, which is just, I live in Salem, Massachusetts. Mercury's just down the road in Ipswich. It's about a 20 minute drive. And I've known those guys for a long time. They used to be a competitor, they've always been friends. And uh, they have a contract brewing model where they either, you know, brew beers for other people or they like to come in and be hands on. And so I've had a very good working relationship with them and will continue to do so for as long as Notch is around. Um, so that, yeah, and I think at that time I probably had an advantage because I got a foot in the door because of my background where. Some contract brewers can be very selective about who they let in the door because they want to make sure they're well financed, they know what they're doing, they're not going to be paying the ass, you know, these types of qualifications. Uh, but now I'm also brewing out of uh, Two Roads Brewing, which is a new brewery in Connecticut, which is a longer drive. <laughs> it's, um, it's two hours and 20, two hours and actually last yesterday was two hours and 40 minutes for me each way. But uh, the, the batch size is larger, so I don't have to be there as much. And they have canning capabilities, so that was really, uh, that was really um, the reason why I'm there. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm at it from an independent brewer model, and um, we can probably continue to do that for my large scale production, because brewing session beer, people have a limit or a ceiling of what they want to spend for session beer. So I need to be able to meet that expectation. And the only way I can do that is to use a facility that has some kind of scale. Uh, you know, if I'm a 2,000 barrel brewer brewing it myself, that beer is going to be a lot more expensive than if I'm using an existing facility, a contract facility. Um, where we can experience greater scale together and then pass it on to the consumer. That's interesting. And in uh, going into uh, bottling and then going into canning um, has its own challenges, I'm sure, with, uh, you know, you can't buy a small amount of cans, I don't think. you got to put them somewhere. And you can... <laughs> so... Yeah, the, 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 can, the canning um, aspect was, um, was a bit of an investment for us. Uh, you have to buy, the minimum was a half trailer load, uh, of cans, which is, you know, it's over 5,000 cases off the top of my head. So it's a significant amount of, uh, of cans and a small brewer isn't going to get any credit terms from suppliers today. They've, they've seen the crash in the late nineties. A lot of them are bit. So today, a lot of the, the smaller brewers that are all on prepaid terms. So that's a lot of money to put up front. Um, but that was, that's for the cans that are pre-printed. And I, they have a great look to them. There are mobile canning operations now that are using, I think it's a heat shrink wrap label mm. that goes over the can. It's more of a traditional application like you would put on a bottle, except it's a it's plastic label that fully wraps. And I, those have a different look. They're not quite as seamless as the, the, um, the, the printed can, but they are uh, allowing smaller brewers to get into cans and have multiple labels where before they weren't able to. So it's, it's a bit of a trade-off. So what your predictions? Uh, you're you're hoping for the for the pendulum to swing a, a bit, uh, you know, back into the into the smaller category, or at least, you know, there are probably several pendulums going on at the same time. Uh, uh, your predictions for the future in in small beers? Um, you know, for low ABV ABV beers, I'm not really sure how much we can grow the category, but I, I have been very. Um, happy with the trend in this past year in the past two years there were some major players that came in very strong i say major players craft craft brewers who came in very strong and have had wild success and have legitimized the category three years ago people didn't think it was legitimate legitimate 
So we see founders with all-day IPA, which is a little bit higher than my ABV definition, but I don't care. It's 4.7. You know, it's a little bit off, big deal. They legitimize session beer in a way that I never could because founders has this, um, you know, beer, beer, beer geek credibility that is just fantastic. So all-day IPA really, I think, from a national standpoint, legitimized session beer. It made it easier for me to sell beer. So thank you, founders. I think that's great. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I, that, that, that's a session IPA. I think, I, I think we're going to see a number of different areas where we, we see different beers, you know, come in that are just happen to be low alcohol. Uh, my, my most popular beer is a, is a, is a Czech session lager. I talked talk about Desitka. It's a 10 Plato. They don't call it pills in the Czech Republic. Um, it, it, to them it's a, it's a light lager, but it's, it's flavorful. There's complexity. Um, it's hoppy. It's something, the trend now is unfiltered. And so that's been my most popular beer, and it's. I think I really think I'm the only one in the country brewing, you know, the Seeker or Czech style session lager, and it's become um, 65% of my business, which is just beyond my wildest dreams. That that would be my flagship. So it tells me that consumers just don't need intensity, and they just don't need um, rich and thick and high alcohol. That they say, hey, you know, sometimes I want something that is backed off. It has to be well made. It has to be crafted. Uh, we want to know the people behind the beer. We have to trust them, and it has to taste good. So it, that's what's great about craft beer. Craft beer has been about educating people about options, and I think as long as we keep educating people about all the options, we'll see the growth in, in, in small beers. And to your point, well, you know, we're aging demographic, and I think a lot of the aging demographic in, in, in uh, craft beer is looking at session beer as a really nice alternative. Or option, I should say, not even an alternative. <laughs> Well, there you go. I appreciate your uh, your taking time, and I wish you the best of luck. Thanks, Chris. No, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Anytime we can uh, spread the word on session beer, it's a good opportunity. Well, thanks again to Chris. I'm doing some experimenting with session beers myself, and I hope to put the uh, tips that Chris passed uh, onto us to uh, good use. I, I, I do love having beers on tap here at the house, but it's kind of like having ice cream sandwiches in the freezer. Uh, <laughs> if they're in there, I'm going to eat them. And if I have high-gravity beer on tap, I'm, I'm going to drink it. Um, my plan is to have some tasty session beers on tap, you know, that are easily accessible, and then and then some, some tasty higher-gravity beers in bottles in the basement that I can chill, you know, maybe one or two at a time to balance things out a bit. Appreciate Lou Bryson uh, setting us uh, in the direction of Chris and uh, listener Dave for setting us in the direction of Lou Bryson. So <laughs> there you go. I greatly appreciate all the all the emails I get from everybody. Uh, they often lead to shows. Um, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to James at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Our basic brewing growler bags are available in our shop. Protect your precious homebrew and craft beer as you take it from place to place. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcasts. We greatly appreciate you doing that. Uh, be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. We've got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. And you can check out our basic brewing shirts in the store, too. Our brewer's logbooks are in the store as well. Keep track of up to 50 batches of beer. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We greatly appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Seagate Cheetah 15K7 600 gigabyte 15,000 RPM SAS 6 big gigabytes per second 16 megabyte cache 3.5 inch internal bare drive. That's a mouthful. And there were, there were 10 of those. So thanks a lot. And uh, watermelon extract 4 ounces. Mmm, I bet there's a watermelon wheat beer in somebody's future. 
Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget, you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on BasicBrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by our buddy Kelly Dots. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. Talk to you next time, everybody. So long.